if you can hear me, say no wall, no band. 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 In 1979, my life turned upside down. My school was closed indefinitely. There were rallies and protests on the streets. The Shah of Iran fled. A few weeks later, with my mother in the street in the sea of people, Ayatollah Khomeini landed. As time went on, our excitement turned into heartbreak as we realized that our revolution had been stolen. Our next door neighbor's best friend, Mari, a thin Kurdish 18-year-old girl, was taken in for passing out flyers. We never saw her again. I was forced to cover my hair in school, then in stores and shops. Then, every single strand of my hair had to be covered in public for life. A few years later, Iraq bombed Iran and the war started and we would hear the radio sirens throughout the streets. When I was 12, my father came from San Francisco back to Iran and he brought with him the most precious of gifts, two navy blue brand new American passports for my sister and I. My mother had lived with my father in the U.S. for three years, during which time she had my sister and I, and then we had moved back to Iran. A theocracy, a war-torn theocracy, is no place for children, he begged her. And she, knowing that she could not leave, did what she thought was the best thing to do. She let us go. I didn't live with my mother for the next 10 years. And my aunt says that for the next year, off and on, she had scalp on her cheeks from the tears. So ever since leaving my mother, airports have been a sacred place. Sacred place the way rooms where people birth and die are sacred places. Every year, two or three, we would visit my mother, and when we would depart, the last day would always have the same ritual. My mother would fight with us just to push us away and put the pain away. My uncle would stand on the scale, holding our bags one at a time, making sure they're not a gram over. Pat, flights from Iran leave for Europe at dawn, so there would be a caravan of us, dozens and dozens, aunts and uncles and cousins and neighbors, going to the airport after the last somber dinner. I would ask them not to go, not to stay up all night, but they would. My grandmother would hug us and cry, saying that she knew she would not see us again. We would all try to hold back our teeth and deny what she said, knowing that she would eventually be right. Eventually I would be up the, on the plane, lying, leaning on my sister, and fall asleep in exhaustion with red eyes. Ever since, airports have been a sacred place. I can't help but scan airports for other travelers. Not travelers that are on business trips for a day or two, or those with tanned bodies and sandals and sand in their hair, but travelers who at that moment are just, this that moment is the world to them. They are hugging each other, not knowing when they're gonna see each other again. They are rejoicing and embracing each other, trying to pretend they don't see how much the other one has aged.
And I stand especially for those families who are showing up with only the bags that they have and nothing else, with no one greeting them. And they're standing there looking brave so their children will know that they too have no idea what tomorrow looks like. Living through a revolution during your formative years changes you for life. Seeing men, few men take over a government using religion as a tool of oppression. Literally rewriting history, shutting down dissent and any conversation, and executing their own children and grandchildren for political thoughts, all for love of power and greed. That changes you for life. So when I had a chance to stand up for justice and for liberties. When the uprising happened in 2009 in Iran, I did and I started United for Iran. My, <laughs> More than half of my colleagues are refugees. They've been tortured and imprisoned in Iran. Reza, my co-director, brilliant mind that we say is changing Iran one app at a time, was banned and kicked out of his graduate program in Iran a week before graduation. Now, he cannot leave the US to do our work. Mohammed cannot see his fiancée because she's a student in Italy. Mehdi was in prison himself in Iran three times. He runs the Iran Prison Atlas, our database of Iran's political prisoners, judges, and prisons. He fled Iran and lived in Turkey for three years with his then three-year-old son and wife. Now here, he's been promised a green card, but he has not been yet given one, so his future is uncertain. heard today here how valuable the immigrant and refugee community are, are. But we're not here, and we're not inviting them in and welcoming them because of what they can do for us. But we are here because we're asking and we are to showing up because of what we can do for them. <laughs> Immigration policy must reflect our value of human decency and, of, of, and hold true the promises we've made. It needs to focus on the biggest heartbreak of our generation, the war in Syria and Yemen. It needs to focus on every single person that's leaving their country because of political oppression. It needs to focus on migrant worker on whose back this economy has been built. Immigration is about loving the other the way we love our own children. We can't look away while our children wash up to shore, while they drown, while children cry and don't let go of the paramedics that are pulling them out of rubble. No. This week at the airports, it's been a battle for humanity. We've seen hundreds of thousands of people yeah. being pushed away. A four-month-old four girl with heart condition being denied. Yeah. And we've seen a five-year-old boy detained alone for five hours without his mother. That's right, Shane. Airports are, have also been the most sacred this week. How many of you were at our airport this week? How many of you saw the picture of the Muslim girl and the Jewish boy on the backs of the fathers? These signs of peace, smiling at each other. There were lawyers in their business suits huddled on the ground, volunteering. There were 
dude showing up with pizza and halal food. Right? There were rallies around the country and around the world saying no. And what touched me the most was the scene from the airport in Detroit where Muslims were praying on protest banners while the protesters were standing behind them making a human shield. This week, we took our airports back. This week, we stood up for humanity. Because this is not just about immigration. This is about the soul of our country. <laughs> Having lived, breathed, and dreamed about justice and civil liberties, I can tell you that this work is not easy. I can also tell you this is the work. It will be hard, it will be dark, and we will only work through it if we can lean on each other. They will tell us that it doesn't matter what we say. They will say it doesn't matter how many of us they are. They are lying. We won yesterday in Seattle because of this. I believe that our work has impact, even if we don't see it today, tomorrow, or for the rest of our lives. And I believe that history has not yet been written, that we're writing it today. And if we so choose, the future is ours. Thank you.